Hello, and welcome to Launch, where we launch into the Word of God and we launch into life with Christ's assistance and guidance. I am Brian Cedars, pastor at First United Methodist Church in Elkins, West Virginia, in case we have not met before or if we don't know each other. Welcome to everyone, whether you attend, uh, are a member, or are watching from near or far. We're glad that you are with us today. This is Thursday, August 13th, and we begin with a trivia question. This one is not as hard as the ones I've shared this week, but it might take some thinking or some digging. In what town did Paul forget his coat? In what town of the ancient world did the Apostle Paul forget his coat? He actually asked someone to bring it back to him. Isn't that interesting? Now we're going to do some good humor. All right. If you're a golfer, you'll appreciate this one. I think that I shall never see a hazard rougher than a tree, a tree o'er which my ball must fly if on the green it is to lie, a tree which stands that green to guard and makes the shot extremely hard, a tree whose leafy arms extend to kill the six iron shot I send. A tree that stands in silence there while angry golfers rave and swear. Irons were made for fools like me who cannot ever miss a tree. That applies to my golf game, I can tell you for sure. Now for our passage, Psalm 141. A Psalm of David. I call to you, Lord. Come quickly to me. Hear me when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Set a guard over my mouth. Lord, keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart be drawn to what is evil so that I take part in wicked deeds along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. Let a righteous man strike me. That is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. That is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it, for my prayer will be against the deeds of evildoers. Their rulers will be thrown down from the cliffs, and the wicked will learn that my words were well spoken. They will say, as one plows and breaks up the earth, so our bones have been scattered at the mouth of the grave. But my eyes are fixed on you, sovereign Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not give me over to death. Keep me safe from the traps set by evildoers, from the snares they have laid for me. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by in safety. Again, that is Psalm 141, 1 through 10. Now, this psalm is about correction. And more specifically, I think, a king accepting correction. For anyone, but especially for a high-ranking figure, to accept correction and to do so humbly is a mark of great leadership. I wonder if this all might be about the prophet Nathan who came to rebuke David over his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah and David accepting that rebuke. The sages do not consider that making no mistakes is a blessing. They believe rather that the great virtue of a man lies in his ability to correct his mistakes and continually to make a new man of himself. The saying there is unknown as far as the author, but a very true and wise statement. Let me share some other statements, some aphorisms, some pithy, wise sayings. An error doesn't become a mistake 
until you refuse to correct it. Progress is made by correcting the mistakes resulting from the making of progress. And this is from J.B. Campbell. If a man or woman cannot be corrected, how can they be discipled? And if they cannot be discipled, how can they be used of God? Experience has two things to teach. The first is that we must correct a great deal. The second, that we must not correct too much. Correction does much, but encouragement does more. Encouragement after censure is as the sun after a shower. Now, if you're into sports like I am, especially golf, you know of Jack Nicklaus. He's considered by most as the greatest golfer who has ever played the game. Once, when he was at the top of his game, he quit playing for 30 days to correct something in his game. He couldn't correct it. He tried, but without success. So he went back to his coach that taught him the game of golf, and his game straightened out. He went on to win more major tournaments than any golfer in history, and I believe still holds that record with Tiger Woods still very close to that. He was willing to admit that he had room to improve even though he was the best golfer on the planet. That is amazing. That is humility. True correction, or if you will, true repentance, is going back to the Lord again and again, back to the cross again and again. It's telling God that you are absolutely dependent on him to change. Just a quick comment. The Facebook uh, internet connection that I have here at my farm is in and out, so if it continues to break up, don't worry. I am also filming this on a separate device, and I will upload it back to Facebook as I upload it to YouTube after the broadcast. So just so uh, you know that, there'll be a good, a good uh, version of this coming up. Now, I came across these Ten Commandments for Men, but they can apply to all. Number one, be a prayer warrior. Two, impact your family before you attempt to impact the world. Three, do something good in your community. Four, impress your children, not your buddies. Five, be a God chaser. Six, take ownership of your mistakes. Seven, make necessary corrections. Eight, be a motivator. Nine, value integrity. And last but not least, intercede daily for your family. Now, this begins with prayer, ends with prayer as far as these Ten Commandments. And there's also two mentions about mistakes or corrections. Uh, psalm begins here, the psalm begins with David talking about prayer. David said, may my prayer be set before you like incense. That's a great way to imagine our prayers before God. That's why some light incense when they pray. In closing, let me tell you about a moment of incense, figuratively speaking. A man's wife had left him and he was completely depressed. He had lost faith in himself and other people and even in God. He was finding no joy in living. One rainy morning, he went to a small neighborhood restaurant for breakfast. Although several people were at the diner, no one was speaking to anyone else. The miserable man hunched over the counter, stirring his coffee with a spoon. In one of the small booths along the window was a young mother with a little girl. They had just been served their food when the little girl broke the sad silence by almost shouting, Mama, why don't we say our prayers here? The waitress who had just served their breakfast turned around and said, Sure, honey, we pray here. Will you say the prayer for us? And she turned and looked at the rest of the people in the restaurant and said, bow your heads. Surprisingly, one by one, the heads were bowed. The little girl then bowed her head, folded her hands and said, God is great. God is good. And we thank him for our food. Amen. That prayer changed the entire atmosphere. People began to talk with one another. The waitress said, we should do that every morning. All of a sudden, said the sad man, my whole frame of mind started to improve. 
From that little girl's example, I started to thank God for all that I did have and stopped majoring in all that I didn't have. I started to choose happiness. You know what? Prayer is choosing happiness. It's choosing a relationship with the Almighty. Prayer is choosing to care. Prayer is choosing life. David chose life and happiness and care when he prayed. We do too. So let us pray. God, we are grateful for this time together. Teach us to accept correction. Give us eyes that don't only look out, but also look inward to discover the rough edges that need some smoothing. And help us with humility to admit our mistakes and to do something about them. We pray, Lord, for our leaders in this country and in this world. Sometimes we find them accepting very little correction. And often we notice that ego can be a real challenge. Well, I pray, Lord, for our community leaders, our state leaders, our national and world leaders to find that humility, to accept correction for the good of all involved. And Lord, we continue to pray that you would turn the tide on this pandemic, that you would give us increased protection and also increased ability, Lord, to, to follow the steps that would help bring this under better control. And we just ask that you would teach us through this time. Help us to rely more fully on you. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. And now to give you the answer. And I did see one pop up here on the Facebook before we had some internet issues. Somebody did have the right answer. The answer is, and the question first, where did Paul leave his coat? In the city of Troas. T-R-O-A-S. And I think it was Timothy that he instructed to bring his coat back to him, along with some other items. And now you know. I wish you the best today. Take care. Looking forward to joining you again and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.